Now, what do I say about this man? What do I say? What do I say? What do you, not a lot. <laughs> I've known Dave for many, many years, and um, he's probably the most humble person you're ever going to meet. He has a real heart for people. He is a really compassionate person. Um, you, you could just pass him when he's in a real rush, and you could say, oh, you know, I'm feeling this or I'm feeling that, and Dave always has time for you. So uh, there's not enough nice words that I can think to say about you, but... That's enough. So, yeah. <laughs> it's Dave. Yeah, definitely. Definitely enough. Um, great, guys. Well, um, such a privilege to be able to be able to share with you. And uh, welcome, as has been said already, but particularly if you're visiting or if you're joining us, recently joined us. Um, we, I think we get into some really great stuff, don't we, uh, that we have to look at. And this term is, I mean, our Christmas season was, was amazing, just amazing. I just was so excited by that. And uh, this term and next term, we're looking at this massive, massive topic of discipleship. Massive and yet central to discipleship. And Tim started us off last week. I thought, such a great overview, such a great introduction to that whole area. So today, I'm going to be talking about, my title is called The Way of Incarnation. The Way of Incarnation. How does that fit in with discipleship? How, does that, how is that relevant with you and me? How does it work all together? We'll find out quite soon. But before we do that, I'm going to ask that you would read with me. We're going to look at the Bible. We're going to read a little bit from the Bible. Um, this will confuse the, the guys with the because it's not on one of my PowerPoints, but it's uh, John 1. So in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 1, we're just going to read a little bit at the beginning of that. So I'll read it out, but if you've got a Bible, if you've got a physical Bible, that's great. Find it. You can read from there. Or if you've got something on your phone, that's great. Read from there. But I think it's just going to be really good to be actually able to read this together. So... The title for this in John 1, in mine, it's a little subtitle at the top, says the word became flesh. And that fits in very well, I think, with the way of incarnation. It says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who did believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Well done, guys. <laughs> this, these guys are just on the, they're amazing at the back. Just round of applause, I think, for the guys at the back. <laughs> you, managed to, uh, you managed to fit that into my PowerPoint without just seamlessly perfect. Um, okay, I want to introduce you to a man right now. His name is Dinesh Palmar. This is what he looks like. Dinesh. A few years ago, in the National Geographic, his story was told. There was quite a big report of him. He is one of over 10,000 Banjis in Ahmedabad, in India. How does he earn his living? How do you earn your living? Well, he earns his living by manually cleaning latrines, sewers, and gutters, and by removing dead animals from the streets. After all, he's a Banji a member of the untouchable or the lowest caste. The lowest castes are called the untouchables for a reason. It's because they do all of the dirty work that no one else wants to do. 
They deal, for example, with dead bodies and much of the manual labor. Just to illustrate this, let me describe a little bit of a typical day's work for Palmer. He removes a concrete manhole cover, cockroaches scurry from the darkness as the stench below fills the streets. Palmer hesitates for only an instant, then drops into a hole, a dark hole, with no gloves, no gas mask, no PPE. His body is hidden inside. He methodically lifts bucket after bucket of excrement over his head. After a little while, he's off to the next job. He leads the way to a nearby, nearby lane. He climbs into several more manholes to scoop out clots of filth and sludge. That's a job, isn't it? Volunteers for this job? <laughs> it's just got worse. <laughs> so why this example of Palmar? Thank you very much. Great illustration. Simply, the God who is more holy and more glorious than we can conceive, who is light itself. We've just read about that in John 1. The one who created all things, who holds all things together by his will. He stepped into his creation, which we had tarnished, he became flesh in our mess, in our dirt. In flesh, he called us to teach us, and he called us to him to teach us the way to walk clean. And he provided the way to remove the filth and sludge from our lives so that we could walk with him forever. He touched our dead bodies so that we could be brought to life. Jesus became untouchable in order to touch our lives. Do you get it? This is not a small deal. This is a big deal. God did that. You see, there's such a glory and a mystery in this. Christmas has just gone. It was good. It was just gone. And we celebrated and we wondered at things like, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, from Isaiah 9.6. And also in this season, we've sung carols, haven't we? We've worshipped at the cross of Jesus and been thankful for his sacrifice for us. But, but, there were 33 years of living among us and three years of ministry before that final week when Jesus went to Jerusalem. Three years of ministry. And I've got three what-ifs just to ask you right now. Think about this. What if the heart of God was to walk with us during those three years and set in place a disciple-making pattern among a few that would mean that even today, thousands of years later, we can be discipled and disciple others to be like him? What if, second what if, what if walking with his disciples was as much a part of the reason that he came? Just let that sink in was as much a part of the reason that he came as was the cross through which everything was made possible. The cross made it possible, but why did he come? Why did he come? That we would be like him. What if, third thing, that God's heart goes beyond forgiveness to loving us so much that he actually calls us to be like him in his glory, to be truly saved, to be as we were created to be, to be truly present with him and with each other. We can settle, friends, for something so much less if we just say, I'm forgiven and that's it. And I think that's not the fullness of God's heart. You know, there's odd little clues. It's all over the place in the scriptures. There's, um, last week we looked at the call of some of the first disciples. I want to put a theory to you that God wants to walk with you. See, it looks like, looks like this. In Genesis 3.8, it says, The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
It seems to be inferred from that that it was common practice for God to walk in the garden with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And it just got me thinking, what if, what if Adam, and sin, Adam and Eve hadn't disobeyed God? What if they continued to walk with God in the cool of day, learning from him, learning his ways, discovering more and more of creation, discovering more of who they were meant to be, discovering fullness after fullness after fullness of all of those things. But what did Adam and Eve do? They hid because of their disobedience in the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Move forward quite a few years, thousands of years, and we get to Matthew 4. It was read last week. Jesus was walking again. God's walking again. God's walking again by the Sea of Galilee. He sees two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They're casting a net into the lake for the fishermen. Again, God calls. God called Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, where are you? Again, God calls. This time, God says, come follow me. Jesus said, I'll send you out to fish for people. And what happens this time? At once, it says, at once, they left their nets and they went and followed Jesus. In Genesis, they hid. In Matthew's gospel, we read from this account, the disciples came and followed Jesus. Were they free from sin? No. They were steeped in their sin still. But they followed Jesus. They followed Jesus. You see, I think, it's my theory, but I think it's true. I think the desire of God has always been to walk with us. I think that's what God wants. He wants to walk with us. In the garden, it's implied that it would be there, but we have it explicitly when God came to walk among us. Of course, over the three years, Jesus walked everywhere. <laughs> There's the odd ride on a donkey, but apart from that, Jesus walked on a colt. Apart from that, Jesus walked, and his disciples walked with him. You see, it's hard to be discipled by a cloud. It's hard to be discipled by a burning bush or a quaking mountain. Every, even a book needs a person to reveal the truth that's in it. Discipleship, in simple forms, needs a body. It needs someone that we can see and touch and follow. It needs someone to demonstrate things, to help us learn how to do what we see them doing. It needs someone to be fully present with us, who understands us, who gets us, who identifies with us, who actually walks in our shoes. To do that, there was only one way. Jesus had to be fully human to be one of us. And you know, Jesus fully embraced this. Jesus' favorite title for himself wasn't the Son of God. It was, anyone know? The Son of Man. That's right, the Son of Man. It's used over 85 times in the Gospels, and 83 times you'll find it on the lips of Jesus, referring to himself. Essentially, Jesus was saying over and over again, I'm flesh and blood, I'm human, I'm flesh and blood, I'm human, I'm one of you. It has tremendous prophetic significance from the book of Daniel, where one like the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days, is given power and authority whose kingdom will be established forever. It's interesting as well that Jesus even uses this title at the, at the pinnacle moment when he's on trial for his very life. And he said, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the living God? And on that occasion, Jesus says, I am. But then how does he answer? He says, and you will see the son of man coming with great power and glory. Notice it's not the son of God coming with great power and glory. It's the son of man coming with great power and glory. I think that's significant. In that moment of uttermost trial, who does God choose to identify with? God or us? It's us. Now, we worship a risen Lord whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, but it's vital to remember that Jesus became fully flesh and blood forever. I'll let that sink in. You see, I read the Bible. You, we can read the Bible together, and it's what it says, it says, even the risen Lord has a body that can be touched and seen. It's there in the resurrection accounts. His body, in the resurrection accounts, still has scars that are visible. 
His body still eats. The resurrected Jesus still eats. He still talks. He still cooks food. He's still there with people. And even in Revelation 1, in the book of Revelation, at the end of our Bibles, John has a revelation of, a revelation of glorified Jesus. And how does he describe him? He says, among the lampstands there was one like the Son of Man. See, Jesus coming in the flesh is a vital part of the revelation of God. It's inferred, I think, that there's a man in heaven forever right now. Jesus, when Jesus ascended, he ascended as a man. I, I don't want to make too much of this because it's a bad illustration, but in one sense, Jesus' humanity was a one-way ticket. It's a one-way ticket. And actually, a man went back to heaven. A resurrected body, yes. A glorified body, yes. But still a body. Still a new creation in that way. And being Jesus coming in the flesh is a vital part of this revelation of God. John later writes in one of his pastoral letters, he says, Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. See, the temptation, and the temptation for many of us is to take the humanity out of Jesus and just worship Jesus. In many senses, it's easier. The author Max Lucado said this. He said, it's not something we like to do to talk about the humanity of Jesus as well as him being God. It's actually uncomfortable it's much easier to keep the humanity out of the incarnation, clean the manure from around the manger, wipe the sweat out of his eyes, pretend he never snored or blew his nose, hit his thumb with a hammer. It's easier to stomach the God that way. There is something about keeping him divine that keeps him distant, packaged, predictable. But don't do it! For heaven's sake, don't. Let him be as human as he intended to be. Let him into the mire and muck of our world. For only if we let him in can he pull us out. You get that? So vital. You see, Jesus pulls us out. And how does Jesus pull us out? He pulls us out by making us his disciples, by calling us as his disciples. Because Jesus is fully human, we can believe, therefore, that we can be like him. How can I be like someone who's not like me? And yet Jesus says, I'm like you, therefore, do what I do. Be like I am. And we say, yes, because we've seen Jesus in the flesh. The theologian Ian Thomas captured this concept well by saying that Jesus became man as God intended man to be. So you want to know what God intends you to be? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. And his glory actually transforms us. It, in that passage that we read together and from John 1, it says, we have seen his glory. But it talks in, later in Corinthians, it says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is spirit. And John 1.14, which is what we read, says, and the word became flesh and dwell among us, and we have seen his glory. Of the, as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, what's been described here is a process as we walk with Jesus, as we follow Jesus, as we talk with Jesus, as we are in his presence, as we become more and more like him, his glory transforms us, changes us. We become more and more like him. We become, as the scripture says, we go from degree of glory to glory. It's his glory working in us. Such a mystery. And as well as that, I would say this, not only do we get transformed, but his mission becomes our mission. His methods become our methods. I loved the illustration last week that Tim shared with us of the dust from a rabbi's feet, the, the blessing, the prayer of blessing, let the, let the dust from the rabbi, your rabbi, be over you. Do you remember that? And yet Jesus, and Jesus was a rabbi. That was one of the titles that they gave him. They talked to him and spoke to him as teacher, rabbi. And yet Jesus was an unconventional rabbi. Most rabbis would have studied under somebody else, 
They would have um, had an apprenticeship with somebody else, but not Jesus. Jesus broke the mold. There was a new way of doing things. And I think this is really important. We think, well, form isn't important. I think it really is important because Jesus set something up in a new way. So although everything was true that Tim said, it's, it's true, it works in that way, but Jesus did things differently. So, for example, it says, We with unveiled face, we behold the glory of the Lord. We're being changed into his likeness. And so what happens is that the way that Jesus discipled, the way that people walked with him, the way that he commissioned them, the way that he did things with them, all of those things are important, those methods. Indeed, all the resources that Jesus used in his ministry are available to us as well. What were those resources? Well, the Word, prayer, the Holy Spirit, fellowship. And Jesus expected, as we heard last week, that his disciples would do even greater things than he did. Ephesians tells us that we are doing, can do immeasurably more than we can even ask or imagine because of the Spirit's work in us. So the reality of Jesus' humanity challenges me in profound ways. This, this is it. What could God do through me if I surrendered to be like Christ? What eternal impact could be wrought if I chose to be obedient as he was? What if I made every effort to follow him, love him, align on my life, my mission, everything around what his desire is from me? Lean on him, be, depend on him in all things. If I did that, what would change? I haven't got time, but I'm going to pick on two things that I think would, are, which are relevant to all of us that would profoundly change. The first is that we would find incredible treasure in suffering. The discovery of treasures buried in suffering. Grief and loss are common experiences of life to all of us. When the disciples followed Jesus, there was grief. They left the livelihood. Some of them left families, actually. There was a giving up of much to follow Jesus for that, that particular calling in that way. I'm not saying that's for everybody. It's for them in that way. And God's call is different for each one of us to be obedient and to surrender to him. But grief and loss are also, of course, central to Jesus' life. Jesus was brutally honest when he spoke of discipleship. Brutally honest, scarily honest. I mean, he said great advertising slogans such as, if anyone would follow me, come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That makes you want to sign up, doesn't it? And yet, for Jesus, this was not a figure of speech. It was demonstrated throughout his life and mission to the cross of his death. And remember that that resurrected Jesus, that resurrected Jesus still bears those scars. And not all scars, of course, are visible. To follow Jesus, there is a real, real cost. Author of The Cost of Discipleship and the Prophetic and Persecuted Voice from the Anti-Nazi Movement called Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew what it was meant to suffer and engage with suffering. There were many years, many times when he was in solitary confinement and he was suffering, imprisoned. In one of the letters from his prison cell, he stated from a place of despair, only the suffering God can help. I think that has two meanings. Only the God who knows suffering can help, and only God can help. But it's the God who knows suffering. You see, there is a place of intimacy with Christ through suffering. I was uh, reminded uh, as I was walking in this morning of just in recent times that I've been, uh, it's been my privilege to be, come alongside some families in times of intense grief. And two statements that I've, that I've, that I've heard from families uh, upon meeting them after tremendous loss, one statement was, uh, it is well with my soul. Another statement was, God is good. Now, those are not trite things. They come from a tremendous place of depth, of suffering, of... They're all in. 
You know, these, these people are all in. But they, there is an intimacy in a place of suffering that we cannot get any other way. I don't know how else to say it. It, it just is. And suffering is part of life. And though we're inclined with privilege allows to follow a crucified Christ without identification with suffering, there comes a point where we're just confronted by utter brokenness. It, it finds us all at some point in our lives. And at this crossroads, though the pain is strong, there is this greater solidarity with Jesus and deeper enjoyment of the sweetness of his love. There's, if you like, sweetness of fruit in the presence of Jesus that only grows in that place. Jesus, of course, had a life of suffering, had a life of being on the margins. But that story doesn't leave us alone. St. Augustine said this of Jesus. He said, Man's maker was made man so that he, the ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain would thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on the journey, the truth might be accused of false witness, the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation be suspended on a wooden cross, the strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life itself might die. This is our God. This is our God. There is suffering in humanity that Jesus totally identifies with. He also says specifically that to follow him will lead to suffering and will lead to cross. It's, there's a, our crosses. There's certainly a cross of not our will, but your will be done. The second thing is what well, sounds what, like a heavy thing, but I think also God, God's humanity changes this in a remarkable way, and that is loneliness defeated. You know, in the account in Genesis, this is before Adam and Eve were disobedient and ate the fruit that they shouldn't have. Before that, everything is good. God did this, it was good. God did this, it was good. You know, there was one thing, one thing, the first thing in Scripture that wasn't good. I don't know if anyone knows what it is. It's not good that man should be alone. The first thing that went, the first area of pain was loneliness. As of Jesus, well, it says he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. If you're rejected, you're by definition lonely. I don't know if you ever think of Jesus as being lonely. Straight away, I go to that point in Gethsemane when none of his disciples were with him. He was totally, totally alone. They fell asleep. They wouldn't stay praying with him. And you have that illustration of, well, not an illustration, the reality of his sweat like blood, sweating with the pain and anticipation of the price that would be paid very soon. But in some other senses, of course, Jesus may have been the loneliest human in history. Loneliness is when we feel we're isolated from others. And where did Jesus come from? He came from eternal presence with the Father. He didn't have that physical presence with his father in the same way. He was born in the likeness of men. How much did that cost Jesus to be absent from the father in that way? He had known fellowship. Before Abraham was, I am. Fellowship, absolute fellowship with the father. And then all of a sudden, he's helpless, a helpless baby. Who on earth could come alongside Jesus and say, I know, who you're, I know what you're going through? He had no equal. No one could say, I get you, I understand you, I know what it's like. No one could know what it was like for Jesus. Jesus was without sin. Now we might think that's uh, great, fantastic, but he's surrounded by sin all the time. 
What a torment that may have been. No one on earth could identify totally with him. No one could put an arm around him. But all of that was a precursor. That moment of loneliness so dark was on that cross at the moment that he who was without sin became sin for us. In that unfathomably horrible, incomprehensible, lonely moment, he felt forsaken by his father and even put it on his lips. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. He was ravaged physically and spiritually beyond human semblance, having spent his earthly life estranged by sinlessness. Now Jesus was estranged by the sin he willingly bore, our sin. I think loneliness is, is, is such a key thing. It's, we're all... It's quiet in the room, but we can all relate to this, can't we? You know, I, I think it's so significant. J Donna just whispered to me beforehand, we've got a group going from the church into Woodhill Prison this morning. I just celebrate that. Lord, we just pray for your presence with them in Jesus' name. We pray for your hand upon them. Father, for the loneliness that's experienced within those prison walls, the isolation that's experienced there, we pray that... Jesus, that you would minister to those that are going in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, they, that can happen because there is an end to loneliness. Jesus, known, knowing loneliness like that, can sympathize with the weakness that we feel. He doesn't merely understand it, but he actually destroys it. Because what happens is that Jesus says, quoted from Hebrews, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's the summary from the book of Hebrews, of words of Jesus. And of course, Jesus said, he said, I, and I will be with you always to the ends of the earth. Because Jesus bore the sin that estranged and alienated from God, died on our behalf, what that does, that restores presence, that, that takes away loneliness. Loneliness is isolation, whereas what God did on the cross, what Jesus did on the cross, makes a way for fellowship, makes a way for walking together. So loneliness, like every form of suffering, is passing away for those who love him. Ahead of you is a full family fellowship of knowing God, of being in the family been sons and daughters of the living God, have been redeemed saints forever. The day is nearing when we'll all know him as we've been fully known. But also in discipleship, we can know him. We have, of course, following the time of Jesus' sacrifice upon the cross, and we're following the time of his re resurrection, he ascended into heaven. And the book of Hebrews says that we have there now interceding for us before the Father, a great high priest. This is a person who is our great high priest interceding for us, who gets us, understands us, has lived our life in fullness and more and more and more and more. There is nothing that we can experience that he has not been there. All things. And so with that, it says, with confidence, we draw near to this throne of grace, that we may find, receive mercy and grace to help. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. That's such an encouragement. I don't know about you, that's such an encouragement. This may sound like a heavy topic, but that is such an encouragement that before God interceding for you right now is someone who fully gets you, understands you, who knows what it's like to walk in your shoes. Every respect faces the temptations that we face daily, faces the challenges that we face daily, and yet he's without sin. Now, that's not a pressure. It just says he's made a way through because he's without sin. And because he's made a way through because he's without sin, so we can find a way through through discipleship to learn to be without sin too. Well, that's good news. that we may receive mercy and find grace. What did John say? We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
I just want to close with a, a, a prayer. Um, I felt like God wanted to speak to us about the humanity of, of Jesus Christ in a powerful way. I think it's before we go any further with this whole thing with discipleship, we need to nail this one. If we don't nail it, it nothing else works. It's a hinge pin. It's what Jesus, uh, it's, it's what um, John said. You know, if anyone says that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, that's not of God. It's absolutely a hinge pin. It's a point, a pivot point, at which everything changes. So I'm just going to pray because I believe that uh, it would be good to thank God for being fully human, but I also have a sense that this morning God would break some chains of our suffering, break some chains of our loneliness. And I'm just going to pray into that. I, I love Swana's word a little bit earlier on in the meeting, hope and patience. You know, this is all possible because of God's incredible patience, how patient God is with us and how he gives us hope. And you remember also that, just this is a parting shot before I pray, you remember when Jesus came? It wasn't with seriousness, was it? it, it basically, the angels announced good news and great joy. Good news and great joy. So, let's just pray. Jesus, I thank you that you came into our world. You came into the latrine, if you like, to clear out our mess. You became untouchable to touch us, to show us the way. I thank you that you became human so that, fully human, so that you could show us how to live and disciple us and say, this is the way, walk in it. That not only say this is the way, but you demonstrated the way. You became the way. You walked physically with us. And we have accounts in our scriptures to guide us in these things. So thank you, Jesus, for, for speaking, and thank you for doing all of this. Father, this morning, just as we consider the reality of suffering and pain and our human condition, Father, I thank you that you fully understand our pain. I thank you that for those who are experiencing loneliness, that the word from heaven is that you are not alone. Father, I thank you, Lord, Lord, I thank you even in the place of pain and grief that we can learn incredible intimacy with you, that we draw to a place where it's only the God, the suffering God who can help. Father, we ask, Lord, that we would be obedient to disciple others. We ask that we would be Go beyond that, beyond companionship, beyond investing, sorry, beyond companionship, beyond just to a, to a deeper place of love, to investing in other else's faith. I pray that we would go to the marginalized, that you did. I pray, Lord, that you would sow in us hope and patience. And Father, I pray, Lord, for even now, where there is suffering, where there is pain in the offering, that you would speak to us, to our hearts, good news and great joy. Weeping may endure for the night, but I thank you, God, through the cross of Jesus, that joy will come in the morning. Amen.